Hello, powerful people, and welcome back to the Power at Work blog. My name is Seth Harris. I'm a senior fellow at the Byrd Center for Social Change. Really excited to have you here for this Power at Work blogcast. We are delighted to have you join us because we've got three old law professor buddies of mine. Well, they're not old. That's not fair to them. Long-standing law professor buddies of mine, uh, Charlotte Garden, Michael Green, and Jeff Hirsch will be talking about the current legal assault on the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board in the Supreme Court, and other legal forums by some anti-union companies. We'll talk about the cases, what they mean, and whether we have entered a new era of no-holds-barred combat between large, wealthy corporations, unions, and the United States government. But before we get to our interview, you should know that the Power at Work blog is a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network, which connects over 100 radio shows and podcasts. To learn more about the network or find other Labor Radio shows and podcasts, visit www.laborradionetwork.org. And if you want to listen to or download any or all of the Power at Work blogcasts, they're available for streaming and download on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Overload, and all the commercial podcast providers. Just search Power at Work on any commercial podcast platform, and you'll find us there. And, and do us a favor, while you're there, give us a five-star rating, and that will help other people to find our content. Uh, if you have people in your life who care about workers, care about worker power, and care about unions, let them know that they can find these Power at Work broadcasts in podcast form on the commercial provider of their choice. So we're talking about a legal assault on the National Labor Relations Board because of three sets of legal stuff, legal cases that have arisen in the last few weeks. The first is a case that's pending at the United States Supreme Court called Starbucks versus McKinney. Second, Elon Musk's, Musk's sp let's do that again. Elon, M I can't even say the man's name. It gives you a sense of uh, sort of the subliminal reaction that I have to it. Uh, second, Elon Musk's SpaceX and Trader Joe's and now Amazon have raised the question of whether the NLRB is unconstitutional. And third, we have two major corporations, and I think a lot of people would argue more than that, but I'm thinking of Starbucks and Amazon, that are blatantly refusing to comply with labor law's requirement that they bargain in good faith with their employees' unions, even though those unions have been certified by the NLRB. And some would argue that there's just a lot of employers out there doing the same thing and threatening the rule of law in the United States. So we're going to dive into the details of those issues, but we're also going to discuss whether there's something new going on. If wealthy corporations have decided to destroy the legal infrastructure that has governed labor relations in the United States for more than 89 years now. Now, when I need help understanding complex and important legal issues, I, I turn to the people who were my colleagues back when I was a law professor before I joined the Obama administration. And today I'm going to bring you three of the very best in the field. Charlotte Garden is the Julius E. Davis Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota School of Law, where she teaches labor law, employment law, and constitutional law. She is very widely published in scholarly journals and has led several amicus curiae efforts in important labor and employment law cases. Very proud to say that Charlotte is one of my co-authors on the public and private sector labor law casebook that we wrote, and she's a friend of the blog who's appeared as a guest on a previous blogcast about the Supreme Court, and I thought she just did a terrific job, so we're thrilled to have her back. Michael Z. Green is professor of law and director of the Workplace Law Program at Texas A&M University School of Law. In addition to being a widely sought-after speaker and writer, Michael's research focuses on understanding the legal implications related to workplace dispute resolution, as well as the intersection of race and alternatives to the court resolution process. He's also the co-author, this may be the way in which he's best known, 
He's the co-author of Labor Law in a Nutshell, which is a really valuable study guide for law students and other people who just need a straightforward introduction to labor law. Jeff Hirsch is the Geneva Jurgen Rand Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina School of Law. It just occurred to me we have all public school law professors here, yay public schools. Uh, so he's at the University of North Carolina School of Law. He has also served as an associate dean at that school. Like Michael and Charlotte, he's very widely published on labor, employment, and regulatory topics, and he's won a duffel bag full of awards for his scholarship, but most important for our purposes, or also important for our purposes, I should say, Jeff has worked in the NLRB's appellate branch. So he's not just familiar with the Supreme Court and familiar with the law, but he also has that on the ground experience working inside the NLRB. So those are our guests. You are our audience. So we are ready for our blogcast about the legal assault on the National Labor Relations Board. Enjoy. So Charlotte, it's great to have you back on the Power at Work blog. Michael and Jeff, great to have you here as first time guests of the Power at Work blog. I, I cannot imagine three better people with whom to be talking about legal issues. I, I Some people have accused me of starting this blog just so I could spend time talking to my friends about issues that I care about, and that's not untrue. I'm not saying it's true, but I'm also saying it's not untrue. <laughs> so uh, let me let me set up this discussion about the legal assault on the, on the NLRB by focusing on three different legal attacks. But after we've addressed those three issues, I'm going to ask all of you if these three attacks are bigger than the sum of their parts, if if the world of labor management relations law, or at least the practice of it, has changed and in a meaningful and ideological way, and most important, if you look at these three situations and conclude that there is a concerted effort by wealthy corporations to destroy private sector labor law or the institution that oversees private sector labor law, uh, and their goal is to weaken unions and to weaken uh, worker power, where does that leave us? Where are we left? So that's I'm going to save that for the end because I want to go through the three issues that I have that I think fit together, and you can throw others in as well. So let's start with topic number one is Starbucks Corporation versus McKinney. Let me say that Kathleen McKinney is an NLRB regional director, so they're not really suing her. <laughs> Starbucks is involved in a lawsuit with the National Labor Relations Board. It's just her name happens to be on the on the case. Um, <clears throat> Starbucks is challenging the standard that courts use to determine whether the NLRB should be granted an injunction that would, for example, force the reinstatement of a worker who has been fired because they were leading a union organizing campaign or participating in a union organizing campaign. And for those who are, are not lawyers and the language is weird to you, injunctions are essentially court orders that immediately or in short order require that some entity or person stop doing something that they are currently doing or do something that they otherwise would not be willing to do. The injunctions in this case are called 10J injunctions, which is the section of the National Labor Relations Act that authorizes them. And basically, Starbucks, which has illegally fired lots and lots of workers involved in organizing campaigns, wants to make it harder for courts to grant an injunction that would allow those workers to get their jobs back. That's the sort of very simple, probably overly simple description of the case. Okay, so Jeff, let me start with you because you are, among many things, a former board lawyer. Um, so how much, and by board, I mean National Labor Relations Board, not B-O-R-E-D. Um, you may be that as well. <laughs> so let me ask you this. How much do 10J injunctions really matter? And will it matter if the NLRB gets fewer of them because the Supreme Court has made it harder for them to get them? Yeah, so I mean, it definitely matters in any case in which the board successfully uh, seeks one, right? It's basically the board processes, including court appeals, can take quite a long time. 
uh, years potentially. Uh, and so the ability to get some sort of injunctive relief uh, throughout that process could be quite important. On the other hand, uh, the board doesn't seek that many 10J uh, injunctions. I think it, over the last 10 years, I was looking, it's been from between six and 30 in any given year, uh, which is a very small drop in the bucket in the you know hundreds and hundreds of uh, unfair labor practice cases that the board uh, pursues every year. So numbers wise, not that big of a deal. Uh, and in an individual case, it is a big deal. Um, we can talk either now or later about the fact that uh, whether or not, uh, however the court comes out in this case, uh, frankly, how much of a bigger deal that is as well, because it's not. I'm not entirely convinced that uh, it's really going to be that big of a substantive difference. Um, of course, depends on how they come out. Well, well, spell that out a little bit. Yeah. Why, why do you think it's not going to be that big a substantive difference? Yeah, and I should note right on the bat that uh, I think I'm in agreement with the board itself here in their uh, opposition to cert. Uh, brief. Uh, they basically argue the same thing. Wait, wait, wait. I'm gonna wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I have to translate that oh, into sorry, human sorry. being. <laughs> so the the National Labor Relations Board opposed the Supreme Court taking this case. Correct. Starbucks asked the Supreme Court to take the case. That's called a petition for a writ of certiorari. The court granted the writ of certiorari, which means the court is going to hear the case. Okay. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> right. <laughs> And the, and the board in this case, like it usually does, uh, generally argues for the court not to take any of its cases because it's generally scared of what the court's going to do to it. Um, but here, one, one reading of what the court is doing is uh, what it does oftentimes, which is trying to settle differences of opinion among the federal courts of appeals. So this sort of so-called circuit split. And basically, all of the, several of the circuits are using somewhat different standards for NLRB 10J injunctions. Uh, some are using a special two-part test. Others are using a more traditional four-part test uh, that is used for sort of more, more general injunctions. Some do a combination of the two. Uh, the board is arguing or argued to the court that Substantively, there's really not that big of a difference among those those three different approaches, uh, because they all sort of incorporate the same general ideas, which is basically a court deciding injunction first looks to uh, a question about does it look like the board would win this case? In other words, does it really look like there's an unfair labor practice uh, that occurred? And then are there some sort of equitable or some sort of reasons that require an injunction now because a sort of later remedy really isn't going to uh, really isn't going to do uh, as much as we need it to do. Um, so we need to freeze things now. Uh, and I'm sort of agree with the board that the different tests kind of all get at the same thing, um, which is not to say that, you know, maybe the court will come out uh, in a way that uh, employers seem to like a little bit more and that lower courts uh, we'll actually use that to sort of clamp down a bit more than they have in the past on 10J uh, uh, motions. That's certainly possible. Um, but I don't see this as, as being a huge impact uh, in the future, no matter which way the court comes. Well, let me ask Michael if he agrees with that, but I'm going to take it from a slightly different perspective with you, Michael. So I included this case in this discussion of a legal assault on the NLRB, but I'm open to the criticism that I'm just overstating it. <laughs> that is this case an effort by Starbucks and the long list of business associations that are supporting Starbucks is part of an effort to weaken the NLRB or is it just, you know, it's just straight ahead litigation? Well, I, I think it, if you, if you look at some of the other amicus briefs that were filed, there's some kind of weird groups that filed some briefs and wait, started talking. Hang on, wait, <laughs> lawyer, <laughs> lawyer to English translation. Amicus uh, okay. briefs are filed by non-parties, friends of the court. This is something that Charlotte has spent a lot of her career doing as well. Uh, it's friends of the court trying to persuade the court to agree with one side or the other and trying to give a different perspective on it. Okay, back to Michael. Sure, and, uh, and so with some of these uh, briefs that were filed, supporting briefs, um, they, they were making broad-based arguments about property rights and violating the Fifth Amendment and, I mean, just over-the-top arguments. So I think there are some interest groups out there who do support you, your thesis, Seth, that this is part of a broader kind of plot to 
maybe take down the NLRB or take down admin, take down administrative agencies as a whole. Um, I think from a, probably from the per perspective of the lawyers and, and actually the two of the lawyers are listed on the brief uh, representing Starbucks. I happen, happen to know those lawyers from the Dallas area, very fine attorneys. I'm sure they, they're doing their best advocacy on behalf of their client um, in, in taking the argument. Um, I was a little surprised that the Supreme Court would take this argument. Um, I mean, it's, it's not even that the Sixth Circuit actually made a problem of it. One judge made a problem about it in a concurring opinion. Um, and yes, as Jeff highlighted, you know, 10, 10 day injunctions don't happen that much. If they don't like it, I'm sure they'll, you know, get the president they want and they'll appoint the general counsel they want and they will see less 10J injunctions come forward and they won't have to worry about the standard. Um, I did look at the Sixth Circuit when I saw this and I thought I came across the Sixth Circuit case where they had actually denied an injunction and they were really worried about irreparable harm and trying to show irreparable harm. And I kind of wonder, what's the irreparable harm to Starbucks if the injunction stays as it is? And I, I'm thinking it'll probably stay as it is, even if you apply whatever this other standard they think you should apply. So it does kind of seem to be much ado about nothing. And so because I think that's the case, I do kind of feed into your conspiracy a little bit, but more from the aspect of why would the Supreme Court take this case? And certainly Justice Gorsuch has said a lot of things about administrative agencies. I'm sure we'll get into this in talking about his theory on what are major questions and things of that nature uh, to kind of attack agencies. So from that aspect, it's more the courts that I'm more concerned about than kind of like, you know, corporations out to kind of get and destroy labor. I think there's kind of a movement within the judiciary to kind of go after certain aspects of administrative law and powerful agencies that protect workers' rights. Great. So, so Charlotte, that's, boy, that's a perfect setup for you because <clears throat> essentially what Jeff and Michael are arguing is substantively, this doesn't make a lot of difference. Uh, procedurally, it doesn't make a lot of difference because there's not that many 10J injunctions in any given year. There's probably something of an interorum. I shouldn't use the phrase interorum. There's a, there's a, a, a you're going to explain that term to your, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to translate myself now. Yes. There's, there's a deterrent effect associated with the availability of an injunctive relief that keeps some employers from doing some things that they shouldn't do. Um, so let me ask you sort of three questions. And that is, are you a conspiracy theorist like I am? Or is it Michael just accused me of being? That's number one. Do you think there's something a little weird about the court taking this case? And let me just say, there was another case that you and I talked about on the Power at Work blog, um, Glacier Northwest, which the Supreme Court absolutely should not have taken. They absolutely positively should not have taken that case. That case was not appropriate for the court. There was a lot of evidence that they just ignored in order to be able to take on the case. So maybe this is another one of those that they shouldn't have taken and they did. And I'm hoping you're going to tell us why they would do that. And then I'm curious about your view. How how should the case come out and how do you think it's going to come out? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for those questions. So, you know, I think one factor in the court wanting to take this case or agreeing to take this case is probably the concurring opinion by Judge Riedler, right? Judge Riedler is um, a Sixth Circuit judge, a, a Donald Trump appointee, very conservative. Um, he said, um, not only does he think the Sixth Circuit applies too lenient a standard, but that he thinks uh, courts ought to be applying, um, you know, what ought to be applying an, an alternative standard in a way that would be fairly different than what most circuit courts do. So he thinks that there ought to be um, a mini trial in district courts before an injunction can be issued. And that would put, um, you know, strain on the board um, because it's just a, a more involved procedure. But more importantly, it would take time. Um, it would take more time than the current process. And, you know, when we're thinking about injunctions um, and when they should issue in the context of a labor organizing campaign, um, you know, it, it's really all about momentum. 
So, you know, every day counts if you are an employer and you fired some workers for organizing and you want um, the chilling effect of doing that to spread through your workforce. Um, so in other words, um, if you are an employer, it's really your interest in a case like this to have things play out for as long as possible. So that's what I think is going on here. Um, and that's, you know, part of why I think the court took this case, right? I think the court saw um, the concurring opinion um, that said, uh, you know, we, you know, I think that courts should be granting injunctions in many fewer cases um, and that district courts should be holding these many trials um, and that that made the court think, um, you know, oh, this is an issue that, uh, you know, we should be getting involved in. Um, what should the court do? Uh, you know, look, I think there are a set of reasons that it makes sense for um, courts to continue applying um, sort of basically the current standard that the Sixth Circuit applies, um, which involves asking whether there is reasonable cause to believe an unfair labor practice has occurred. So, you know, looking at the allegations um, in the NLRB's complaint um, and kind of considering the um, you know, briefs that the parties file, and then also thinking about whether you need an injunction because of the chilling effect of what the employer is alleged to have done. Um, so I think that, you know, is a practical way to approach these cases. Um, I say that in part because an important thing here that makes NLRB injunctions different than kind of normal injunctions is that in, an, in, in the standard case where a court considers granting an injunction, what's happening is you've got, you know, plaintiff versus defendant, plaintiff asks for an injunction, says stop the defendant from doing what they're doing. At that point, um, two things are true. One, there hasn't been really any determination by any, you know, sort of neutral fact finder or judge or whatever, um, that there's something to this case. Um, and uh, two, the court that is hearing the motion for an injunction is also the court that's going to decide the case. Um, those things aren't true in the board context, right? In the board context, um, there has been this initial determination by a board prosecutor and then approval by the board to go forward and seek the injunction. That means there's been a decision by, you know, neutral, um, you know, uh, new, new, by neutral board members, right, um, neutral, the, the general counsel, that there's something here. Um, and then, you know, eventually the case will be decided by the board, not by the district court that would hear the um, injunction proceeding, right? So having a sideshow where you develop a bunch of facts in the district court, like that doesn't make sense to me. Right. Second, there's this momentum <laughs> issue, um, which I think is, you know, important um, in, you know, it's always important in a board case, right, especially important when you're dealing with a kind of like unfolding dynamics in um, a union campaign. And then there's also a kind of textual reason I think that's right. Um, the language of the National Labor Relations Act is just improper. That appears in four places in the statute. Um, one place it appears contrasts um, or, or I should say, imposes an additional requirement on, on when um, an injunction can be sought or can be granted. Um, and that additional requirement is um, a determination about or an allegation about irreparable injury um, to the, you know, to an employer. Um, so to me, right, it doesn't make sense, right? It can't be right. Um, that the just and proper standard also incorporates um, a need to find irreparable injury, which is the kind of alternative standard that um, Judge Riedler thought should apply and that the employers are arguing for here. So that may have been too big a, you know, that I no, may no, no, have no. gone on I, for too long. <laughs> no, no, no. But I, let me just say, um, it once again, the court is going to be tested in how seriously it takes its argument that textualism is the approach, really close <laughs> reading of the language of the statute should be the only approach, not looking at legislative history, not looking at anything else, to deciding these cases. My view is they use textualism when it reaches the result they want. They don't use textualism when it doesn't reach the result they want. If they make the argument, a textualist argument in the way that you've just suggested, the board should win. I'm not holding my breath for that, but thanks. Okay, I got you to, all three of you, 
on the record, I'm predicting sort of how this comes out, or at least assessing what you think it's going to be. Uh, you can stay up to date with the latest news about workers, worker power, and unions by subscribing to the Power at Work blog. You'll receive the weekly download, a Power at Work newsletter sent straight to your inbox. The weekly download collects about two dozen of the week's articles, academic studies, press releases, podcasts, and videos from across the internet. We find the stories and deliver them directly to you. So subscribe to the weekly download right now on the front page of the Power at Work blog. Go to poweratwork.com. Uh, let's turn to topic number two, uh, which is a question that I thought was resolved, and that is, is the NLRB unconstitutional? That's sort of how the press is covering it. That's not really what's, what's going on. Um, all of you know, just for our, our audience's purposes, uh, all of you know that the Supreme Court held that the National Labor Relations Act was a constitutional exercise of Congress's power. They, they held that only 87 years ago during the New Deal. It was a case called NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin. In most labor law case, uh, courses, we don't even teach that case mm -hmm. anymore because it's so clearly received wisdom, sort of bedrock law now. That's not the issue here. That's not the issue here. As, as I understand the issue, both... Elon Musk's SpaceX and Trader Joe's, the grocery store chain. And Amazon have, today. And Amazon just did it today? Yep, today. yep. How about that? Breaking, breaking news breaking on the news. Power of Work yeah. blog. Yeah. How about that? They all have argued, I think in different forums, that Congress violated the Constitution back in 1935 when it included in the National Labor Relations Act, provisions that prohibited the president from removing members of the NLRB, NLRB board members, and administrative law judges at the NLRB from their offices unless there is just cause. They don't, the statute doesn't use the phrase just cause, it uses the phrase cause, but that's what it, it's just, in a union contract, the phrase would be just cause. So essentially, if the courts agree with the companies, the NLRB will still exist. It will not be ruled unconstitutionally. You got to pull it apart. You have to disassemble the building in which it does its work. <laughs> but the board members and the ALJs will lose their employment protections, their just cause employment protections. Okay. So, Charlotte, you are both a constitutional lawyer and a labor lawyer. So, I want you to help put this in context for us. So again, I included this on our list of potential legal assaults on the NLRB. But there's a bigger assault going on here, right? Why don't you put this in context for us? Yeah, sure. So um, I do teach Jones and Lachlan in my common law class, not do in my legal really? law class. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, oh, uh, and do you, wait, do you teach it in common law or labor law? Yeah, yeah, I teach it in common law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's not. Even, um, I think you and I wrote a case book together. I don't even think it's in the case book. That we, might be right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, as an Easter egg for your viewers, um, I have behind me a photograph of Senator Wagner celebrating on the day the Supreme Court handed down Jones and wow. Lockwood's deal. Yes. Um, <laughs> maybe it's not an Easter egg if I tell you about it. Um, okay. <laughs> so, you know. The broader context for this is something called the unitary executive theory, um, and that is a legal theory most closely associated or sort of prominently articulated in the Nixon administration. So um, when um, President Nixon did not want to hand over um, the record, the secret recordings in the Oval Office of him discussing the Watergate break-in with people, um, he asserted that he should be able to order federal prosecutors who, of course, were employed within the executive branch writ large to stop seeking the tapes. So versions of that theory have been kicking around, um, you know, sort of ever since. And, you know, versions of that theory or aspects of that theory have had some success in the Supreme Court. Of course, now, um, you know, as we'll probably talk about later, and as Michael already talked about, you know, the Supreme Court has moved um, substantially to the right, right? The composition has changed. And now there is this sense of um, 
you know, I think possibility. Um, if you are a lawyer who wants to dismantle the functioning of administrative agencies, so um, we're seeing you know kind of new iterations of arguments that um, you know either have previously been rejected or that um, you know the court has just sort of declined to embrace. Um, so, for example, um, back in 1935. Uh, the Supreme Court held that um, Congress could give four cause protections for from removal to members of um, kind of multi-member bodies, right? So like the Federal Trade Commission or the SEC um, or the National Labor Relations Board. And so now, um, you know, these employers are saying, well, you know, things have changed and that rule either shouldn't exist at all or shouldn't apply to the board. Right. They're really reaching for, um, you know, what a few years ago I would have thought of as an argument that is just just off the table. Um, so, you know, I would sort of I would sort of put these arguments kind of in that bucket all in all in sort of different ways or to different extents. Right. Like these are arguments that um, are kind of newly um, newly seem available to parties. Um, and in fact, um, are currently pending in front of the Supreme Court in a case called Salo Law, right, which is about the Securities and Exchange Commission. There are some important differences between the SEC um, and the SEC ALJs and the NLRB and NLRB ALJs. Um, and so even if um, the court ends up ruling for the challenger in Salo Law, that doesn't necessarily mean that the same rule would apply. You're saying, you're saying Salo Law, but I think you mean SEC versus Jarkasi. Oh yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> Sale law has already been decided, and yes, yeah, 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 yeah. right. But but this is but it's SEC versus Jarkasi, which raises yeah. the question of whether SEC ALJs can have just cause protection. Sorry to interrupt. Exactly. No, no, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, so you know, the court will decide that case by probably the end of June, um, and. You know, I think right now um, employers sort of see that this argument is pending. Um, they, you know, know the issues on the table. Um, they don't want to be left out. Right? As it turns <laughs> out, the court is kind of really open to these um, to these arguments. Right. So, Jeff, I want to I'm going to ask you a version of the question I asked you last time about this issue as well. And it's what would the effects of a decision like this be. And I, I, I jokingly said, you know, the NLRB wouldn't cease to exist. Yeah. They wouldn't have to pull the building apart that they now occupy in, I think it's in Southwest Washington. They used to be, since I've been there. Yeah. They, yeah, they used to have prime real estate yeah. and now they're, they're off by the Department of Transportation near the ballpark, actually. Yeah. Um, so, but, so the NLRB will continue to exist, but will it be different and will it be different in a meaningful way? Yeah, and I think it's it's probably given that question, it's worth thinking about kind of the specifics of what the challenge seems to be. Uh, and the, the only one that I've been able to really see details on is the SpaceX complaint. Um, and it basically they're arguing, and it's the same attorneys arguing at least the the Trader Joe's as well, sort of three separate challenges. Uh, the first one uh, goes to, frankly, a, a Biden board uh, decision called Thrive, uh, where the board uh, sort of expanded on the type of remedies, monetary remedies that it might order, uh, sort of allowing for, um, y you know, sort of, if you lose your job, and as a result, you, you know, lost your apartment, and that that caused uh, extra costs that, that you might be able to recover that. So basically, the SpaceX is arguing that that violates the constitutional right to a jury trial. Um, you know, Obviously, the board's remedies are already fairly paltry to begin with, uh, and so uh, you know limiting what they're able to do uh, certainly matters. Uh, you could say, on the other hand, this is a relatively new thing that the board's been doing, uh, so it just at worst might take us back, you know, a year or two, uh, and what the board had been doing before. So not existential, uh, although not unimportant either. Um, the other issue is actually related to what we were talking about first, which is the challenge to the board members themselves actually has to do with the 10J injunctions um, and basically arguing that because the board members have to, by statute, have to approve a general counsel's ability to seek a 10J injunction, that they're unconstitutionally acting both in a prosecutorial role uh, and as an adjudicatory role. 
uh, and that that's, that's somehow creating a, a, at least an appearance of bias. Uh, that one is the biggest stretch to me. I don't, the only case that, that SpaceX uh, was using there was, you know, a split court decision dealing with like a criminal prosecution where the state Supreme Court justice was the prosecuting attorney uh, for the, for the, uh, for, <laughs> and the only like, you know, and the three dissenting justices are all still in the court. Um, but if that one were, were uh, to succeed, I think that would, you know, further that, that might have a, have a bigger impact on 10 J injunctions. Cause there would, unless the statutes changed, I'm not sure if the board's going to be able to seek 10 J injunctions, uh, under the current structure with the analog, with the board members themselves. And then finally, I think the biggest potential impact is the ALJ. Um, and the idea that, uh, as the fifth circuit held in drug C that, uh, the just cause protection for ALJs, um, uh, are unconstitutional. I think, you know, as you refer to Seth, uh, under this sort of closest Supreme Court precedent, um, the court expressly said, oh, we're not, you know, going to blow up the ALJ process. They can just be removed at will. Um, and so that's a little bit of a mitigating factor, right? That um, they apparently, you know, could still function uh, and still hear adjudications. Um, Right, there's concern about their independence, of course, uh, particularly in the long run, that you get a president who doesn't like what an ALJ is doing um, and they could just fire them. There's obviously a chilling factor at play there. So that that could have a real impact. It's not going to be an instant, you know, the board processes are blown up, though, unless unless the court really goes farther than it has before. Which who yeah. knows? <laughs> well, so that so the concern there is politicization, right? Yeah, right. That, the, the, that the ALJs will basically do what their political overlords want them to do, and the biggest political overlord is the person sitting in the White House. Right. So, but Michael, I want to that that's sort of the the most the most the broadest concern. But I want to sort of take that from an opposite perspective, and it's this: a lot of people argue that the NLRB is already politicized, right? That the board's decisions flip-flop back and forth depending upon which president appointed the majority on the board. The majority on the board goes to the president's party. The minority on the board goes to members of another party. It's actually not specified that it must be the other party, another party. So I guess hypothetically, you could have three Democrats and two Greens <laughs> if you could find two Greens who are qualified or two you mean Green Party or two me. Two Greens, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I'd be okay with the former, not the latter. Um, so, but, but here's the, here's the, I, I wanted you to take sort of a skeptic's approach to this. Hmm. Wouldn't ruling that the NLRA unconstitutionally limits the president's control over board members and ALJs simply acknowledge the reality that the NLRB is operating as a political entity anyway? Um. I don't think taking it away makes that acknowledgement. I mean, I think we all know that. I mean, everybody knows that, right? I mean, um, there's certain key decisions, especially now. I mean, I, I would say especially since the, I mean, it was a little bit during the um, Clinton board to the George W. board where there was some back and forth, but from the Obama board to the Trump board and now to the Biden board, uh, the number of key cases you see where the same issues are being addressed and one board is decided in one way and another board is decided the other way um, certainly raises the question of politicization of the board. Um, and, you know, Charlotte and Jeff and I were on a, a program, a law, a law review symposium I, I tried to put together back in 2015 at Emory at the 80th anniversary of the NLRB, it was really the first time in 20 years where you had all five board members, both the, the, at that time, the three Democrats and the two Republicans all serving. And I made, I wrote an article I called the NLRB as an Uber agency. And what I really meant by that is that when you have the both sides, you have both democratic parties, they're dealing with some really tough issues. I don't know whether I agree one way or another how you deal with email communications in the workplace, for example. I do. And, well, I know you do. <laughs> uh, but there's argument. I think there's good arguments on both sides of that. 
and the fact that you have some of the most experienced labor lawyers as board members using their expertise, not Justice Gorsuch, not a federal district court judge somewhere, but NLRB members who have that kind of expertise, I think that's crucial. And when Charlotte mentioned the unitary executive, in that CELA law case that involved the CFPB, the problem there was you had a single agency head. We're talking about NLRB board members with their expertise. And in fact, in CELA law, they mentioned, they, they mentioned a case called Humphrey's Executor, where they talked about the fact that you have expertise amongst different sides of the equation, both Democrat and Republican. And so that's a limit on the executive's ability to do that. I don't see how you distinguish that for the NLRB here. I don't think it sends a message of politicization. We understand that happens anyway. And that's the real benefit of the NLRB to me, and why I call it an Uber agency. I think that there's benefit of that kind of cyclical. We, in fact, the board has done it for years. They had a, they have a little rule they call Midland Life that deals with factual misrepresentations that occur during an election campaign. And for 20 years, they went back and forth, back and forth. And then they eventually got a rule that's been in place now for almost 30 years. And so that's kind of like that laboratory that's working to try and figure out what's the best way from an expertise perspective to deal with it because the politics is embedded in this because of the appointments by the president to the members of the board. So yes, it is politicized. I don't know if if, if, if ruling the way, the way that Tesla wants to rule on this particular issue, one, I don't think it should be that way. CELA law makes it clear that they shouldn't do that. Um, the administrative law judges, maybe that's a little bit different, but then you're gonna destroy almost every agency that has administrative law. It's not just the NLRB, it would be OSHA, um, in terms of dealing with administrative law judges there, the SEC that destroys the whole administrative structure. Is that what they're trying to do? Well, maybe that is what they're trying to do. I and think one, that... not to interrupt stuff, but you know, God, no, this God. move us to our next topic. But you know, one of the board members that was at that conference that uh, Michael arranged is on is the attorney, one of the attorneys of record in the SpaceX mm -hmm. and Trader Joe's case, challenging <laughs> the very position he once held. That's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's that's very, very interesting. I guess once you have lost the job, job protections don't mean very much <laughs> yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or just uh, real I, cynicism. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or zealous advocacy. Or Let's zealous not rule out the possibility of yeah. zealous right, advocacy. Yeah. The Power at Work blog is a project of the Burns Center for Social Change at Northeastern University. The Burn Center develops innovative, participatory, and equitable approaches to solving public problems using new technology. Our faculty and fellows are accomplished, nationally recognized change makers. Interested in learning more? Go to burns.northeastern.edu and sign up for our mailing list. And you can follow us on social media at Burn Center on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. The Burn Center for Social Change, from demanding change to making it. All right, so let's turn to our, our our third issue, and this is not this is not really a case. This is not a Supreme Court decision. This is not a an argument made to the board or to the district courts. This is sort of my sense of what we're seeing right now, and and you all are going to be something of a reality check on on my take on on this issue. So, not talking about a particular case. Instead, we're talking about the behavior of some major brand name corporations. We've mentioned some of them, Starbucks, Amazon, Trader Joe's, there are some others. With respect both to their statutory legal duty to bargain, they have a duty to bargain in good faith under the National Labor Relations Act if a union has been certified by the National Labor Relations Board, and their obligation under the law not to discriminate against workers based on their support or opposition to a union. Now, I don't I don't have data to back this up, or perhaps one or more of you does, but I have the sense that at least some corporate employers have decided they're simply not going to comply with labor law anymore. Now, the one statistic that I've seen is that Starbucks has lost 48 out of 49 cases before NLRB administrative law judges in the context of this organizing campaign that's going on from Workers United. And 
And I, I, I won't speak for them, but they certainly give the public impression that they couldn't care less about that fact. Amazon has been held liable <clears throat> for dozens of unfair labor practices, including the failure to bargain in good faith with the Amazon Labor Union, which organized uh, JFK 8, the warehouse in Staten Island. Trader Joe's has essentially refused to bargain with its, with, with its independent union, at least in one or more of its, of its locations. So, Michael, you you spend time talking to both management lawyers and and uh, union lawyers. Uh, let me say, in my prior life, when I spent a lot of time talking to management lawyers, especially about, admittedly, employment law issues, things like overtime or pension issues or others, they would always, particularly the big companies, would always talk about, oh, we have a culture of compliance meaning we're going to comply because that's who we are. It's not about whether or not we're going to be held liable or get sued. We do it because our organization just believes in complying with the law. So my question to you, and I admit it's a little bit of a loaded question, is, is that idea of a culture of compliance a myth? Or does it simply not apply to labor law? All right. Well, uh, so you, you mentioned that I, I do talk to both uh, union and management. I, I was actually at one point served as the uh, secretary of the ABA's labor and employment law section, which made me have this kind of neutral role dealing. With, that's a very constituency driven organization and having to deal with both sides of the aisle regarding uh, a lot of these issues. Um, it, it, those numbers are kind of staggering that you mentioned regarding um uh, Starbucks and Amazon and how they've responded. Um, I think this a lot of what I call the new organizing, um, which I think a lot of it has sprung from COVID, where you saw so many workers who didn't realize that they were essential workers. You know, someone that's a barista uh, has to find out that they're a, an essential worker because they bring you some coffee. Um, now they have to go to work. And if they're concerned about their safety protections, they really started to understand the value of having a collective voice and someone else protecting them and addressing these issues. And these are the kind of businesses that had no idea that anyone would ever have the gall in their mind to ever organize them. And so I think that mindset fits into how these responses are because um, I will tell you many, many years ago, uh, I'm not going to mention a company, maybe you do some searches, you might find it, but there was one particular company in their call for proposals for outside counsel to represent this major corporation. They had also said things like, not only are we a family, we care about our workers, we we do everything we can to make this a family setting. And when it gets to the level where they sue us, they've breached the family code. And we want to hire attorneys who understand just how bad it is when the family is ruptured like that, that you're not only willing to represent us to the death, you're willing to take on sanctions if necessary to defend us. Um, and so sometimes that rhetoric gets into the mindset of a company that feels like this is not a place where we've never needed to have unions before. And why is this going on? And so they take on that kind of, you know, Rambo mentality. And I don't think it necessarily has to do with labor law. It might be just any time they feel like, what is this about? Like, we're such a good company. Like you said, this compliance mi mindset, we comply, we do all the good things. There must be something subversive going on here and we need to respond in a subversive way back to that. Um, I think that's a sad uh, mm -hmm. circumstance. And I don't think it's, I can't say it's representative of all companies and certainly not the management attorneys I come across. They're just trying to do the best they can for their clients. But it is an underlying issue going on right now. So at this point, I won't call you a conspiracy theorist. I'll just say that um, there is some support and you've got data <laughs> that you just brought forward that shows, I mean, 
How can you be worried about an injunction when you have done so many unfair labor practices and and, and repeatedly found unfair labor practices, but still that is what they do? Yeah, that 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 little speech that you just gave uh, <laughs> that was in that advertisement that could have come right out of a transcript of Howard Schultz's interviews at the time this organizing started. He talked about how he was personally offended and this is a yeah. family and we do all these wonderful things and yep. benefits and blah, 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 blah. It's, it's perfectly consistent with what you're just saying. Okay. So Charlotte, well, I, I, just, I just want to say for the record, go, that go, it jump in. was not Starbucks. It was not it was Starbucks. Starbucks. Okay. It was I well it. before Starbucks. It's many okay. years. You, you protected yourself. It's a from popular company though, but yes, we got it. Yeah. So, so, so Charlotte, you and I have known each other for a long time. You know that I, I, I don't, I, I wasn't born yesterday. I've been doing this for a long time. Um, and you know the and the earth did not start five years ago or three years ago or even ten years ago. So have times changed, or is this just more of the same law breaking that we've seen in the past? Give uh, is it, it? Give me a reality check on my sense that we're just in a different era now, where brand name major corporations, consumer brands, are violating the law dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times and seemingly don't care. So, you know, I think it's sort of, I, I think it's a continuation rather than a sea change. Um, you know, I, I think if you look at like Kate Braun from Brenner's work um, from, you know, I, I, I want to say she reviewed cases from the nineties. Um, you know, she found rampant unfair labor practices and um, the same kind of persistent refusals to bargain were commonplace. Um, I agree, though, that when kind of brand name companies, especially companies that kind of market themselves in other ways as being sort of progressive companies that care about their workers um, and that have a kind of customer base that's relatively liberal leaning, um, that when those companies think that we can engage in this just rampant sort of illegal union busting um, that we are now seeing, um, that, that, is, that that suggests that the idea of union busting has just sort of, that, they, that at least their view is that union busting has just been broadly socialized. Um, and so that's why I think it's, the continuation is important, right? Because there is this, there's been, I think, a long process of um, sort of socializing the idea that, you know, of course, um, an employer is going to fight a union with every tool available, including potentially illegal tools that are available. Um, so I, so I think part, so I think there's that, um, and then I think there's a change in terms of, um, you know, I, I agree with Michael that part of this is about, you know, we're just we're seeing more organizing, um, including in industries that, you know. Previously, it's been sort of very difficult um, for unions to get kind of a toehold. I think that's part that's part of it. And then I think a big part of it is that um, courts are changing. So the idea that um, new kinds of arguments will be acceptable um, and might succeed um, is also driving uh, driving part of this. Yeah, uh, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Is that the uh, arguments that it's okay for us to break the law are now going to be more acceptable in some courts. That's mm -hmm. a very interesting perspective. Jeff, I, 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 I want to ask you essentially the same question, but I want to take it from a slightly different angle. And that is, uh, are we just hearing about it more now? You know, we, everybody with a phone is a reporter and Workers United and Amazon Labor Union and the Trader Joe's Union and AFSCME and uh, Unite Here and, uh, uh, you know, the UAW on campuses and the UAW in the auto shop. They have been very sophisticated about getting the word out when the law is broken. And they particularly have been great about getting the word out when their workers get reinstated to their jobs and they have big parties and they have, you know, big celebrations and they walk the person. I mean, there, it has become something more of a spectacle. Is it just that it's more salient? And let me ask you, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Charlotte's point is, 
Well, you know what? Maybe that's normalizing law breaking in the labor law space for a lot of employers. If Starbucks can do it, we can do it. Or is it saying to employers, there's going to be a cost here. There's going to be a cost and, and we're going to let everybody in the public know about it. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a good question. And I frankly agree with everything that Michael and Cheryl have said, which makes me adding something interesting, a little more difficult. But, you know, I sort of maybe pivoting off of them. You know, I agree that I, I, do, I don't think this is a difference in kind. It's as Charlotte said, it's not a sea change, you know, from, you know, 1935 on, we have seen employers really trying to uh, fight back hard. Um, and that's certainly been true the last few decades, right? This part of the equation as well is, uh, as, as labor people know, the NLRB's remedies are quite weak. Uh, and so the, the penalty for employers, particularly on a financial level is quite low. Um, and so oftentimes you are left with questions about, you know, sort of the social cost or the PR cost, um, which which might be a more indirect but more significant financial cost, which I think then does get into your sort of question about social media. And I think you're absolutely right that part of it is stuff that's always kind of happened. And I remember plenty of cases um, you know, the very first case I had as an NLRB attorney was a refusal to bargain case where the employer was just like, no, I'm not going to bargain with you, uh, even though they were clearly didn't have a leg to stand on, um, which is why they gave it to a brand new lawyer. Uh, but, you know, now, um, you know, that that uh, unions and employees are able to highlight it much more. You combine that with the fact that oftentimes when you're dealing with high profile companies like Tesla, like Starbucks, like Amazon, right, that just creates a lot more interest, reporters call more um, and, and focus on it more. So it highlights it, which again can cut both ways, right? It sort of, you know, as Charlotte said, it maybe that helps normalize it more on the employer side. On the other side, right? I mean, I've always uh, talked about the fact that uh, high profile employers have added risks. Um, you know, we talked before the show about Duke, uh, in their relationship to the grad students. I mean, one of the things, reasons they backed off, I understand, is they were getting a lot of heat uh, from, from you know, uh, undergrads and other interested parties because they're so high profile. So there's some risk there. Um, and that leads me to maybe one final point I wanna make, which is, uh, you know, one of the things that always struck me practicing labor law, uh, and I don't know if it's unique to labor law or just, just maybe uh, sort of an added element that, that you don't typically see, but just how personal it can be, uh, and that oftentimes these cases or, or the situations that lead to cases can be driven by the individuals involved. Uh, I mean, Elon Musk would be my poster child for that. Howard Schultz as well from Starbucks, as you mentioned, um, that particularly- You know, if you don't, if you don't yeah. mention Jeff Bezos, he's gonna be very That's jealous. True. Yeah, yeah, you okay. have to Jeff, we'll, we'll throw the other too. Jeff in too. Um, but, you know, I think that there's something about unions, right? And they're, they of course have a statutory seat at the table. Uh, and I think it really offends even employers that otherwise think they have these kind of this kind of pro-social uh, outlook on life that, you know, it really offends their autonomy um, in a way that's visceral almost. Um, and again, I can think of, you know, several cases I had at the NLRB where uh, an employer was spending tens of thousands of dollars to litigate a clear loser of the case. But you could almost just feel the rage coming from the, from the briefs, uh, and I really think that's something unique, fairly unique to unions in particular in their role, um, and that might be driving some of what we're seeing as well. That's that's absolutely uh, fascinating, and let me just say, I think for some for some unions, eliciting rage is the point. Yeah, I mean that's that's, <laughs> that's the goal because it gets them what they want. Okay, yeah. now I want to get. We're running way longer than I had hoped we were going to run, but but I want to get to the big question. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to cut anybody off because you all are so, so interesting to listen to. Uh, but so let's get to the big overarching question. Okay. So for many years, corporate employers and trade associations have successfully used the courts to chip away at the NLRB and at workers' rights under the act. And you all teach all of these cases. We could, we could go through a long litany of them. We don't have to do that here. Uh, those of you who haven't been to law school, Trust us, four law professors, trust us. So, uh, and let me say one example would be that the kind of employer behaviors that are legal under labor law would make the head of a banana republic shake his or her head, almost certainly his head, in disbelief. It, it's incredible, some of the things that are allowed 
for employers during union organizing campaigns. But taking into account everything we've talked about, has something changed? And in particular, rather than just seeking to manipulate the law through the courts and use the courts to weaken and narrow the law, are corporate employers now basically just trying to blow it all up? Is that, are we at the sort of the leading edge of an effort to really destroy the institution or weaken the institution or neuter the institution that oversees private sector labor law and in the process just blow up labor law? Charlotte, let me start with you. What do you think? Uh, you know, one thing I think is really telling about all this um, is, um, so, you yeah. know, I started at the beginning talking about um, the statutory language, the idea that this phrase just improper is present in the act four times. One place it's present is a, is a provision that is there to help employers um, when they are being secondarily boycotted um, or secondarily struck. So it's interesting to me that we're seeing employers arguing for a much more difficult to meet injunction standard because there's kind of a be careful what you wish for um, angle to all this, right? Um, presumably the same rule will apply to this other provision that is there to protect employers. I, I, th I don't think employers have failed to notice this, right? Um, to me, it says that employers are more concerned about facing board enforcement proceedings than they are about having to go to court um, or you know, see the board go to, go to court on their behalf. Um, that suggests to me uh, that employers are um, you know, thinking, right? We will continue to fight unions, including through illegal methods, um, and we don't want to face injunctions. We are more worried about that than we are about the possibility that unions will do things to us that could entitle us to injunctions. So I, you know, I, I think that is a telling, right? I think that is a telling aspect to this um, that suggests that, uh, you know, yeah, there is a, there is, I think there is a, like, let's blow this all up, um, you know, sort of, uh, Vibe, you know, just yeah, just under the surface, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Michael, what do you think? You're sort of more, you're an institutionalist, and there's an assault on the institution, or at least seems to be, and maybe an assault on the institution. Uh, or you know, is is this just business as usual? Well, I I think that the assault that I believe that is that is. And it's not just on the NLRB, as I said, I believe that there is a uh, judicial mindset that is creeping into the federal judiciary and it's possibly probably taking over the Supreme Court to rid themselves of powerful agency actors completely. Um, and that's really more the fear, because think about it, even though there's a, a stronger interest right now in organizing, there's surveys that say people think highly of unions more than they have in many, many years. Yet union density is not a threat to uh, major manufacturing companies, but yet there is still all this activity. And I think a lot of it is driving it is, you know, various think tanks and the federal judiciary that are coming up with even more ways. And yes, I do. I, I definitely agree with Charlotte. I think the one thing that they do fear is, is board activity. In fact, the person they really fear is Jennifer Abruzzo. Um, and they're worried- The general counsel, the general counsel sorry, of the yes, National the general Labor Relations Council, Board. The National Labor Relations Board, who has made certain statements about how to be aggressive in trying to prosecute things under the act. And that is what they fear more more than anything and they're using the federal judiciary which has started to create a lot of these arguments and it is shocking to me that i am talking about 1935 and uh I, i'm actually i just had a discussion about lochner the other day which is a supreme court case um which was actually led up to the nlrb case you mentioned in 1935 which finally said it is not unconstitutional to regulate in this area and I see that kind of thing going on and it, it shocks me. And I think that's the broader concern 
that uh, we need to be looking at. And I think if it, if given their day, they will destroy the NLRB. They will destroy all the powerful. They I, I'm still upset about the OSHA case that was decided. Uh, you know, we we, we can't yes. talk about that. I, we could talk a whole podcast about that again. <laughs> but in terms of how that was decided and some of the things that Justice Gorsuch said in his opinion. Um, so I think that's the real concern for me at this stage about the institution. I hear you. But let me just say the deregulatory assault that's coming from the courts is in part about the court's agglomerating power to themselves, seizing power that the Constitution yeah. doesn't give them and yeah. uh, attacking their co-equal branches of government that they don't really see as co-equal. Yeah. But that's there's also an economic component to that and a social component to it. And that is if you weaken the administrative state, you also make the people who are protected by the administrative state, by the regulatory state, more vulnerable, including workers who don't have collective power. So yeah. I, I I I think there's both sides that all right, Jeff. Let me let, let, let me, me ask you. I wanted to. I no, just want to say one, one, one quick thing that was Charlotte said: be careful what you ask for. Mm -hmm. um, if if you really do think that you can get rid of NLRB members because of statutory language given a just cause, then they should get rid of the postmaster general. Um, uh oh. So uh oh. Wait a minute. Don't go there. It's too controversial. That's I'm, too controversial. The president should have the authority to get rid of the postmaster general. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Jeff. Oh, my goodness. My, my head is exploding from what Michael <laughs> just said. Um, I'm not going to say whether or not I was ever in any conversations about that when I worked in the White <laughs> House. I'm just going to I'm just going to say that. OK, so, Jeff, I want to I'm going to ask you to sort of take us into the future a little bit. Let's let's say that employers do undermine the NLRB. They make it weak. They somehow maybe even destroy it. What is that going to mean? What does that mean for workers? What does it mean for worker power? What does it mean for unions? Is it possible that it would be better? Yeah, possible. Unlikely, though, I think. Um, you know, and, and again, I yet again agree with both with Michael and uh, Charlotte, right? Michael's exactly right that this is part of a much broader project, I think, uh, to, you know, attack the uh, agencies and just regulation in general. Um, and although I think, you know, the labor uh, and employment laws are a central piece of that because of the economic impact, um, and then, you know, Charlotte sort of te teed up uh, your question to me, which is, uh, you know, beware what you ask for. And, and I do know that is, you know, over the last, you know, couple of decades, uh, folks, certainly academics, I've heard a few people in the labor movement suggest that maybe workers and unions would be better off uh, without the NLRA. Um, I remember, really, uh, I, just yeah, to interrupt, please. I remember President Lane Kirkland of the AFL-CIO yeah, yeah. Saying, yep. let's get rid of it, and it'll be mano a mano. Yeah, and he now I'm not sure he really meant that, right. but he certainly made a got a great applause line out of it. Yeah, and it, I mean, it, I, I will say that I don't necessarily agree with that as sort of a predictive matter, but right, I mean, there is an argument that 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 could be the case. That you know, again, as Charlotte had referred to, there are actually numerous restrictions on union behavior, particularly sort of secondary boycotts and secondary strikes. Um, and we, of course, you know, we've been doing a little history lesson, but we can go out back before 1935. Um, and uh, frankly, labor relations were super violent, uh, very disruptive. Um, I remember reading a, a biography of the famed lawyer, Clarence Darrow, who was actually mainly a labor lawyer. And he mainly practiced criminal law because that's what labor, labor, labor law mainly was back then. Um, and. Uh, that's not a good thing for employers either. Whether that would happen or not, I don't know. And frankly, I'm, I'm a little dubious that uh, workers would be the ones coming out on top if that were to happen. Um, and then just maybe not going quite that far, but, uh, you know, short of labor law being blown up, uh, I think, frankly, probably what most employers uh, who are involved in this litigation are seeking are just the constant chipping away. Um, you know, taking an agency that already, frankly, doesn't have a lot of remedial power and just chipping at it further. So it's sort of uh, more and more toothless. Um, so it's there. The structure's there. The limits on unions are there. But, you know, it can just do less and less. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, that was a depressing note to end on. Yes. Let me just say. <laughs> you asked so, <laughs> but, but I did. I did. I did. Into it. So let me just say, this is just as great a conversation as I knew it was going to be. 
I knew that you three would be the right guests to bring on to talk about this very big topic and to reel me in with my <laughs> sort of conspiracy theory approaches to these things. So a special thank you to Charlotte Garden, Jeff Hirsch, Michael Green for spending your time with us. It's great to see all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Hey, thanks a lot for joining us for this blogcast and sticking with us all the way to the end. I want to remind you that you can connect with the Power at Work blog on social media. We have pages on LinkedIn and Facebook. Just search Power at Work blog. You can find us at Power at Work blog on Twitter X and threads. You can find us at Power at Work on Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon as well. And you can find all the Power at Work blogcasts on YouTube, look for the Burn Center for Social Change channel. That's where you'll find them. Most important, most important, after you're done watching this broadcast, go to the front page of the Power at Work blog and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. We will send you the weekly download. We'll send you updates on the content that we have uh, newly posted on the blog. It's just a great way to stay connected to us. So thanks again for joining us. We will see you right here on the blog again very soon. Thanks.